So continuing on, what I'd like to do is uh, explain uh, the conditions under which um, we can say uh, taking an integral of this form um, in setting it equal to zero will imply that this function right here uh, has to also be equal to zero. Um, the uh, first step in this direction is to explain what's called the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. And uh, this lemma can be stated as follows. This is actually lemma one um, in the book by Gilfond and Foman. Essentially, it says the following. Uh, if the function m is continuous, so m of x is in c0 of the interval from a to b, and if the integral from a to b of m of x times eta of x dx is equal to zero for every function eta of x that is continuous such that eta of a is zero and eta of b is zero. Uh, so the, the eta is kind of like our variation and has to be zero uh, at the endpoints. Then we can conclude that the function m of x is identically zero for all x in the interval from a to b. This lemma has a very nice proof, uh, and essentially it's a proof by contradiction. Um, so we're going to assume that there exists some point x0 in the interval from a to b, such that m at x naught is not equal to zero. And uh, without loss of generality, we'll assume that at this x naught, function m is positive. Um, if you uh, assume that it's negative, the proof essentially extends uh, exactly in exactly the same way. Um, so uh, we can we can go ahead and assume that it's positive uh, with the, the the knowledge that if we assume that it's negative, the proof will essentially be the same with some minor changes. So with this assumption that m is non-zero at some point x naught, it helps to kind of draw a graph of what's going on here. Let's say this is A and this is B. This is the point X naught here. And this is the value of the function M at X naught. Because of the fact that M is a continuous function, um, there has to be an interval on which it is non-zero. Um, so uh, the function essentially will have to look something like this. There'll have to be some point x2, which could be very close to x0. Same thing on this side. There should be some point x1, uh, where the function continuously extends up to m, or up to m at x0. Um, And because this is a proof by contradiction, essentially what we need to do now is 
figure out why this contradicts our uh, this assumption contradicts um, the uh, the statements in the, the in the lemma. So while we've assumed that m is continuous and the integral of m times eta is zero for all eta uh, in the set of continuous functions. What we need to do now is find uh, an eta that's continuous and satisfies these two conditions, that eta of a and eta of b is zero, um, that, that contradicts uh, one of our assumptions. And uh, I'll let you think about that for a second, but uh, the easiest eta to choose, eta of x, will be the function that's, uh, say, the polynomial function x minus x1 times x2 minus x, when x is between x1 and x2. In zero, otherwise, this function eta satisfies both of the boundary conditions. It's zero at a. It's zero at b, um, and it's uh, a positive function on the interval from x1 to x2. The contradiction here comes about when we do the integral from a to b of m of x times eta of x, because uh, this eta function is zero from uh, when you're we're away from x1 and x2, but it's non-zero inside the interval from x1 to x2, um, this integral will reduce to the integral from x1 to x2 of m of x times x minus x1 times x2 minus x dx. And because this m is a positive function inside this interval, and x minus x1, x, x2 minus x, this uh, product right here is also a positive function, uh, we're taking the integral of a positive function here, and therefore um, this integral is going to have to be a positive value. In calculus too. And this contradicts our assumption because our assumption is that the integral of m of x times eta of x dx equals zero for all eta that are it's continuous and uh, zero at the boundaries. Therefore, the conclusion of this proof is the negation of our assumption, which is that for all x in the interval from a, a to a, b, so for all x not in the interval from closed interval from a to b, m of x not must be equal to zero. The next lemma that will be very important for us uh, in proving uh, what we want to show about the uh, the integration by parts from before uh, is um, lemma two, uh, which is the following. So if m of x is continuous on the interval from a to b and if the integral from a to b of m of x times eta prime of x equals zero for every function eta of x in the space of continuously differentiable functions with the maximum norm from before, d1 of ab, satisfying our boundary conditions, eta of a equals eta of b equals zero, 
then the function m of x is a constant for all x in the interval from a to b. The proof of this is um, going to use the previous theorem uh, and be based along the same lines. If we define c, this constant to be equal to the integral from a to b of m of x dx over b minus a, which is just saying that c is the average value of the function m of x on the interval, we can rewrite this expression as the integral of m of x minus c from a to b is equal to zero. By multiplying both sides with b minus a and uh, noting that b minus a is just the integral of one from a to b. If we now define eta of x, to be equal to the integral from a to x of m of xi minus c d xi, using the fact that this is a continuous function, so therefore uh, we can do this. This, uh, this integral from a to x, and also note that the, the derivative of um, eta of x is just equal to the function m of x minus c by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So uh, this function eta automatically belongs to the set uh, d1 or the set of continuous functions um, because uh, m itself is a continuous function. It also satisfies the conditions uh, that it's zero at um, a uh, based on the fact that plugging a into this integral will give you the integral from a to a, which is zero, and uh, plugging b into this integral uh, will be zero because this integral equals zero. And uh, now note that taking the integral of the function m of x minus c times eta prime of x dx. We can say some interesting stuff about uh, this, uh, these functions. Um, specifically, uh, re recall that eta prime is the derivative of this function right here, which is m of x minus c. So this integral is the same thing as the integral from a to b of m of x minus c squared dx. However, um, on the other hand, if you look at um, what this is uh, as we kind of uh, uh, do out this multiplication, this is the same thing as the integral from a to b of m of x times eta prime, which is m of x times m of x minus c minus c times the integral from a to b of eta prime, which is just eta of b minus eta of a. And eta of b is zero. Eta of a is zero. And if you remember our hypothesis, which is that m of x is continuous, and if um, the integral of m times eta prime equals zero, for every eta in d1, so we're assuming that this equals zero for every eta in d1, um, 
where recall this right here is our eta prime of x, um, then we conclude that this integral by our hypothesis is zero, and this entire thing has to be equal to zero. So we've shown that um, the integral of m of x minus c squared made over made of v has to be equal to zero. And since m of x minus c squared is a, a positive function on this interval, we must conclude that m of x is identically equal to a constant for all x in the interval from a to b. This lemma is actually uh, really important. It's um, sometimes called the du Dubois Raymond lemma. And uh, we're going to see that uh, it'll actually allow us to um, write the uh, first variation in uh, an integral form. Uh, which is very, very interesting. But for now, we're going to leave it at this um, and kind of move on to uh, a third lemma that I want to show um, that allows us to do the integration by parts that we did earlier for converting the um, original form of the variation, which was this form of the variation right here. Uh, and then we did an integration by parts and turn it into this form right here um the uh the, the, the next uh lemma is going to justify this step and so the final lemma that i want to show in this pursuit of uh, making uh, this integration by parts rigorous uh i i, I want to show the following if alpha of x and beta of x are continuous functions in the interval from a to b and if the integral from a to b of alpha of x times h of x plus beta of x times h prime of x dx equals zero for a function h in d1 of a b so a continuous function with the, the sum of the uh, the max norms uh, such that h of a h of b both equal zero then we have a few conclusions the function beta of x is differentiable and the derivative beta prime of x is equal to alpha of x for all x in the interval from a to b. And uh, this is essentially going to allow us to do that integration by parts and uh, uh, convert the first form of the variation into the form with Euler's equation in it, with the Euler-Lagrange equation in it. So to prove this theorem, we can uh, start by uh, setting the function a of x to be equal to the integral from a to x of alpha of xi d xi. And if we turn our attention now to this first term, the alpha times h, and we integrate this first term by parts, so alpha of x times h of x 
dx from a to b using our definition of a, uh, which is uh, differentiable uh, because alpha is a continuous function. So the derivative of this is just equal to alpha. Um, so we can do an integration by parts here on alpha times h. Because we've assumed h to be differentiable, uh, and therefore uh, when we do the integration by parts, uh, recall that the x derivative of a times h will be equal to a prime times h plus a times h prime. a prime is just alpha. So the integral of alpha times h of x is uh, the integral of this minus the integral of this. So it becomes a times h evaluated at the endpoints, b and a minus the integral of a times h prime. from A to B. And uh, by our assumption, uh, H is zero at B and A. So this entire term is equal to zero. And this means that uh, the original equation, this equation right here, is the same thing as the integral from a to b of this term, the integral of this term becomes negative the integral of a times h prime. So this will be negative a of x plus beta of x times h prime of x dx. And this allows us to apply lemma two that we just proved. To obtain that beta of x minus a of x is constant. Must be some constant c. And so if we differentiate this expression by definition, beta prime of x minus a prime of x must be equal to zero, but a prime is just alpha of x by definition. So beta prime is equal to alpha of x. And we achieve the desired result as asserted uh, because alpha is a continuous function and um, uh, this means that beta prime is a continuous function, which means that beta is continuously differentiable. And I want to emphasize that um, we did not assume beta of x is differentiable. We've showed that it has to be differentiable under the uh, the assumptions that we we we've, uh, we we made on um, h and on the continuity of beta and alpha originally. Um, so this is this is very very neat. And essentially now we have all of the machinery that we need to uh, write down the necessary conditions for optimality of a functional. Um, keep in mind that this alpha of x is the fy prime, or the fy term that appears in the first variation derivation, and this beta of x is this fy prime that appears in uh, the first variation derivation that we did a little while ago to get to this formula for the first variation. And so before I um, go over the necessary condition for optimality, uh, I want to recap uh, some of the things that were shown. So uh, essentially we took the increment of a general functional um, j of y plus h 
minus j of y. And uh, we defined what it means for a functional j to be differentiable, um, or for the, the total derivative of this functional to exist. And that essentially means that we need to find this linear uh, continuous functional delta j, which is the for shade derivative or for shade differential of the functional j. Uh, and this satisfies an approximation of the form. Uh, we have a remainder functional r of h, the limit of which over the norm, the function space norm of h, goes to zero as the size of h goes to zero. For integral functionals, we showed that the uh, linear term, the linear first variation, is in fact equal to the integral of fy times h plus fy times h prime, which is itself a linear functional of h. And I've discussed the conditions necessary to rewrite this functional as um, the following by doing an integration by parts. We get this is going to be fy minus the x derivative of fy prime. Oh, this is y prime right here. All times h plus fy prime times h evaluated at the boundaries. For the simplest form, this thing right here is zero because h of b and h of a is zero. And I discussed the conditions necessary to, um, if this thing right here equals zero, this integral equals zero, um, we, we know now exactly what we need to conclude that fy minus ddx of fy prime must equal zero. Um, so the conditions to get the uh, Euler-Lagrange ODE from the condition that the first variation must be equal to zero. And so for the next part of this lecture, I plan on showing to you um, that a necessary condition for the maximality or minimality of uh, the uh, functional i is that the first variation or the first shade differential of this functional must be equal to zero in a manner completely analogous to in 1D, um, having the first derivative be equal to zero, or in uh, multiple dimensions, having the gradient of um, the, the a function be equal to zero at a maxima or minima. Uh, 